Today there are no Israelites waiting by the river Chavor. But what if they moved east, taking their place names with them? One of the passes between Afghanistan and Pakistan is known to the world as the Khyber Pass. is one of the most lawless and dangerous places on earth. It is the heart of Pakistan's northwest frontier, the wild west of the east. The first thing one notices is that the Pakistani government has no real authority here. The only way to obtain safe passage is to travel with an armed escort from the ruling people in the area, the Pathans. They have guarded the Khyber Pass for more than 2,000 years driving away Genghis Khan, the British Army, and most recently, the Soviets. In Hebrew, it's known as the Havor Pass, the same name as in the Bible. And next to the Khyber Pass, there's a city called Peshawar in Pakistan. Peshawar means the same thing, the Havor Pass. So we thought, could the Khyber be Havor in the Bible? If it is, there should be here a river called Goza. And right there, flowing into the Kabul River, is the River Ghazni. If this is Havor, we thought, there should be somewhere around here, the city Hara. And 300 kilometers away, in Afghanistan, there's a city Harat. The whole world knows this area as a hotbed of Islamic fundamentalism. There are 15 million Pathans and not a single Jew among them. But we set out to investigate whether under the Islamic surface lies an Israelite past. The first clue was the fact that the Pathans claimed to descend from Afghan, son of King Saul of Israel. From their perspective, Afghanistan is an Israelite name. At worship, they seem like any other Muslims. When studying the Quran, however, they rock their bodies in the manner of Jews. To this day, it is an ancient code called Pukhtun Wali, rather than Islamic law which commands their ultimate loyalty. Puhtu Wali, the code of the Puhtu. And what is this Puhtu Wali? It's basically Old Testament law in a kind of unforgiving way, where you don't have any kind of rabbinical softening of it. Eye for an eye means eye for an eye, literally. Adultery, you're finished. If there is a conflict between your own Puhtu Wali law and Islam, which do the Pathans choose? Our customs are those of the Puktun, or Pathan. There are 11 Pathan tribes in the Khyber. We all have the same customs. The main law here is the Islamic Sharia. But we Pathan follow our own specific Puktun Wali customs. For example, according to Islam, there must be established evidence for the conviction of adultery. You cannot convict anyone without sufficient evidence of fact. But according to Puktun Wali, if there is even the slightest suspicion of an illegitimate relationship between a man and a woman, both are convicted and killed. The matter is closed, and there is nothing left to discuss. As in the Bible, the Pathans still engage in animal sacrifices for religious purposes. I am of the Musahel, the people of Moses. We make sacrifices of sheep. For example, at a wedding festival, our elders would sacrifice four sheep. Today, when times are good, a man can sacrifice ten sheep. 
We make these sacrifices to please God and the people too. Also, some people used to light oil lamps on Friday nights to ask for forgiveness and blessings from God. Such are our traditions. We are in a country that is supposedly dominated by Muslims, but not Muslims, just any Muslims, Muslim fundamentalism. And yet we come face to face with people that say we are Musahel. We are from the people of Moses. And as we travel among these people who look like they stepped off the pages of the Bible, Semitic faces, long beards, biblical garb, prayer shawls, and as the evidence mounted, we could not help but feel that maybe here among the Pathans of Afghanistan and Pakistan, we would find the answers to our quest. We were astounded to learn that the Pathans adhere to biblical laws that were thought to have disappeared thousands of years ago. As in the Bible, those accused of manslaughter can escape to designated cities of refuge. It is mentioned in our old books that if you kill someone unintentionally, then you can flee to a designated place of refuge. Our books tell us that Moses ordered Joshua to establish cities of refuge and told the people that they should honor them. Today, we educated people think it is backwards to protect a criminal in this way, but the people in those areas of refuge look upon the matter as holy. To protect a fugitive is the sacred job of the elders. They treat him as their guest. It seems the Pathans are trapped in time, tenaciously adhering to their ancient ways. They've literally created a wall between themselves and the outside world. They live in these extended family compounds, their women hidden inside. As in the Bible, the Pathan women observe a code of modesty which rarely allows them to emerge. I asked the Pathan, how could you have love songs when you keep your women hidden? It's what, a man singing a song to someone in the kitchen from the other room, the dining room? He said, no, he laughed and he said, all our love songs take place at wells. The only legitimate place for a woman in modesty to be seen is at the well. And immediately it struck me that every one of the biblical romances happens at a well. Moses meets Sipporah at a well. Right? Jacob meets Rachel and Leah at the well. Rebecca for Isaac is met at the well. It's always at the well. To enter the path on marketplaces is to step back in time. Defying all probabilities, the Pathans still live in tribal groups with Israelite names. Rabbani is similar to the tribe of Reuven, Levani, the tribe of Levi, and Shinwari, the tribe of Shimon. One Pathan tribe known as Gadun is very small in numbers, not unlike the lost tribe of Gad. Interestingly, the most numerous tribe among the Pathans is Afridi and the most numerous tribe in ancient Israel was Ephraim. There is even a sub-tribe called Waziri, known for wearing its hair long. In biblical times, Naziri, such as Samson, also did not cut their hair. So you have Reuven, 
גד, אפרים, שמעון. Four more tribes. So we'd actually located nine of the tribes. Or let me put it differently. We think we located nine of the tribes. If we haven't located nine of the tribes, then it's a very strange coincidence going on that you have all these people with biblical names, with biblical practices, with an Israelite memory, exactly where they should be according to the biblical map. If someone can come up with another explanation, I'm open to it. But I couldn't understand it. <laughs> When I was young and had no beard, my grandfather's uncle died at the age of 115. We called him Baba, or Grandfather. He used to say that we are the children of Israel. I was young, and at that age people forget things. They don't care much about history or talk of this kind. But now I would like to know what are our origins? Where do we come from? Our grandfathers always told us that we are from the Bani Israel, the children of Israel. They said the Jews are as Pathan as we are. It's clear that a Judaic memory persists, but were there ever people here who openly identified with Judaism? If you look up Harat in the Encyclopedia Judaica, for example, you'll find one or two paragraphs. If you look up a Western Jewish community, you'll find pages and pages and pages. And when you look up Harat, it says the Jewish community may have been in Harat for somewhere between a thousand and two thousand years. They're talking about a community that lived somewhere for at least a thousand years, and there's a paragraph or two on them. What does this tell us? It tells us that they're lost to our consciousness, that they've fallen off the Western radar screen. In Harat, we find this cemetery covered with stars of David and Hebrew script. For at least a thousand years, it served one of the oldest continuous Jewish communities in the world. The Jews of Harat are no more. The last of them left in the late 1980s following the Soviet invasion. The country is now torn by civil war, and yet a Pathan tribesman agrees to take us to one of the old synagogues. For hundreds of years, people entered this house of prayer through the grand doorways leading into its beautiful sanctuary. Today we enter through an artillery hole blasted by Soviet shells. There is now a tiny community of Afghani Jews in Israel. Like the Bukharans, they are largely unknown here. They remember their former Pathan neighbors as not quite Jewish, but perhaps related to them in some way. They were the ones who wore these prayer shawls, four-cornered garments like we do. And they didn't really know what they were, and they used to be surprised to see us wearing similar things. They would say to us, you're Jews? How could you be Jews? They'd be surprised. I remember them coming from the border areas, from the mountains, from Pakistan, places like Jalalabad. And I remember people said that to this day they still lit candles on the Sabbath. They would put the candles under these baskets and didn't know why they were doing it. They had all these traditions they didn't know the origins of. 
Except they said, that is what our forefathers did. Did they think they were Jewish? They thought they were more Jewish than us. <laughs> The prophets say that equal numbers of Israelites and Judeans will herald the Messiah. Interestingly, the number of Pathans and Jews in the world is virtually identical. The prophecy also foretells that it is Menashe and Ephraim that will take the lead in the return. In India, we had encountered the Menashe. If we were right, here among the Afridi, we had come face to face with Ephraim. However, before we could accept that the end of days was upon us, we needed more proof. On the road to Armageddon, it now seemed appropriate that our journey take us through a minefield. We needed harder evidence that the Pathans were of the lost tribes so we went to the Afghani city of Kandahar, where in the 1950s a stone covered in ancient script was discovered. During the Soviet invasion, this stone was buried under rubble and surrounded by mines. Here, red dots mark undetonated mines, which we skirted to get to the site. Twenty-three hundred years ago, the Buddhist emperor Ashoka put up propaganda pillars throughout his empire. Until the Kandahar discovery, it was thought that these stones were always written in Sanskrit. But the stone buried here is written in Aramaic. In other words, the people then living here spoke in the everyday language of the Israelite tribes. We came here with a local elder in the hope of photographing it. But in its present state, that proved impossible. It's under here. The stone is very big and there is ancient writing all over it. Same hard surface as this one, but no one can get to it now. This is definitely the place. There's no point in looking any further. We did look further. We were tipped off that across the border in Pakistan, there was another stone rarely mentioned by Western scholars. Look at that. There it is, right over there. What is See? it? What is it? That's the Here, the stone was accessible. Like to our surprise, we discovered that it too was not written in Sanskrit, but in the Aramaic alphabet. I see all the letters, the Aleph, the Ain, and I'm standing in front of this 2,300-year-old postcard from the Lost Tribes. And when we pack up our gear and we go, and I'm like in shock, because I didn't expect to find it. I was thinking it's in Gandahar. I didn't know there was a one, another one here. And there's two more in places we didn't go. And one has on it the Hebrew month of Elul. So then this guide comes up to me, and they told me, don't say you're Jewish, don't say anything because people here are very Muslim, they may not take kindly to you. So he says, why were you able to read that? And I feel, I don't want to lie to this guy. And I said, because I'm a Jew. And this person, who's supposed to be my enemy, leans over with tears in his eyes, embraces me, and says, then you are my brother. So maybe it was happening. Maybe the end of time was unfolding. I was standing there and I got goosebumps. I said, wait a minute, is this it? Am I, gonna, am I making a film or am I turning into the reporter from Armageddon? <laughs> 